Sam Simmons, LADC behavioral consultant, co-host of Voices on 80.9 Camel JFM, and conference organizer. He specializes in practic practical, cultural, sensitive, trauma-informed work with African-American males and their families. I want to read something out of the Quality Life, where he is being featured, if any of you have seen this. Him with um, other African-American men from our community. And at the end, it says, how can we heal trauma? Simmons also encourages healthy stress management and making peace with historical and cultural trauma that deeply impacts the African-American community overall. And that's what we have been doing the last day and a half, is talking about our entire community we are also talking about our partners and our allies. And so would you please welcome Samuel Simmons. Okay. Oh, well, all that woo woo, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I hope I meet some of y'all expectations. I don't know about this. This is, this is, this particular, let me move this down a little bit. There you go, I think that's better. This particular lecture has been very difficult to put together um, for a couple reasons. You know, I, I've, I got in my mind what I wanted to say because, well, one of the reasons for the lecture to start with is for the last seven years, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing um, a piece usually every time on historical trauma. And the question was, or the statement has been over the last few years, what are we going to do? Right? And, you know, initially my whole thing was is to get it drummed in the, the community's head to frame historical trauma in a way where we connect the dots to what's going on now. You know, we can talk about historical trauma and then, you know, and then jump from historical trauma, the term, and jump to slave mentality. Okay, so what does that mean? How do you connect the dots? It just don't kind of pop up. What does that look like? What has it looked like over the di many different years? And, and I think we've done a pretty good job of doing that. At least folks around the country think we are, because all of a sudden, since last year, I've been traveling a lot, talking about this at different uh, organiz African American organizations. It is always great to be appreciated by your own, okay? Uh, and sometimes appreciated by your own more outside of town than in town, which is a whole nother conversation for another day. Although I don't have that much problem here anymore, so I guess I should not complain. I come from a long line of complainers, and if you know me, you know <laughs> that I, I whine a lot, I play victim a lot, and I'm far from a victim, so, you know, let's be honest. And folks look at me like, right, you know, they don't give me no sympathy or nothing. So, so this lecture is not, you know, you'll see some stuff that come up on the screen, but I might not talk about it, okay? Secondly, I lost on, on uh, with this Friday, Thursday morning, I was transferring some files from one stick to another, and I have this one stick I carry, every place got all my stuff on it, and it ended up getting partially erased. So I had to rewrite this last night, and I think I finished about two o'clock in the morning, and I still don't like it, so. But I wanted to be real honest and sincere, because lately, I, my lectures have been more scripted, and I'm known to have less scripted lectures, and folks seem to, appreciate that a little bit more, especially within the community, okay? So we're gonna have a little script, a little less script, okay? So how are the children? That's the title of this fits into what we're talking about because is that that's really what it is. How are our children doing? And the reason that I wanted to focus on the children, because again, yeah, we are considered black man healing. It really wasn't about black men. 
It was about the black community. I knew I would get your attention if I talked about healing black men because in and outside our community, we ain't healable. Now, we talk a good game, but I said in and outside the community, we are not necessarily healable. At least that's the way folks treat us. And we treat ourselves that way, too. Okay? And so, but we, we wanted to, you know, the question was, what is a plan, Sam? What is a plan? I had a plan in my mind, and y'all wouldn't have liked the plan I had. I wasn't going to be nice to nobody. <laughs> I'm probably not going to, I'm going to be a little, gonna, but I figured if I talk about children, it would tame it down a little bit so you at least hear me. You still might not like what I'm going to say. Folks have, sometimes they don't like what I say and then they sit there like, mm, you know, he right. You know, <laughs> he, or, or and I like this one. You know you could have said it a different way. Well, I wanted to get your attention and I didn't want to waste a lot of breath. You know, okay. I ain't in the waste a lot of breath, okay. So how are the children? So I said, well, let, let, let us frame this in, around children. Because everybody, everybody, even the wino on the corner, as I mentioned yesterday, if you go ask them about children, they'll say, children is our future. <laughs> Man, we some quoting folks. Children is our future. I, if I say to this room, what is your favorite quote? And everybody had that quote. We can quote down, but do we live up to those? And, and like I said, even the wine on the corner will say, children are future, and then he's going to ask me for a dollar. And might ask the child who walked by for a dollar, too. And, you know, different segments of our society, and we, you know, we had uh, our sp uh, earlier with uh, the speaker yesterday, the speaker today, talk about the, the issues, the pain that our children and families are experiencing. So when people, when I ask how are the children and folks give me an answer, I don't believe anybody at this point. Really. Because the numbers are not changing a lot. I was looking at numbers in 1960 and you know when we was gonna have this war on poverty and that kind of thing during Johnson's era. Do you know that those numbers haven't, that it went down, but we still have the large disparity between black children and white children? So, how are the children? Black children are more than three times likely to be poor than white children. Black children are twice as likely to die before the age 18 than white children. Black children arrive in kindergarten at a lower level of school readiness than white children. Intimate partner suicide, uh, homicide is the leading cause of death for African American women between the ages of 15 and 45. I had to look that up three, four times, see if that was true, but it is. The number of black children and teenagers killed by guns between 1963 and 2010 is 17 times higher than that recorded that were lynched of black people of all ages between 1882 and 1968. You know, there was a, a smart aleck kind of conversation done by a white supremacist. He says, we don't have to do nothing to black folks. They're doing it themselves. And then, we, and then we'll get insulted by somebody making a statement and that kind of stuff. We don't, we, we got to spend less time being insulted and more time working, doing some work. You know? And I'm not saying that what another group of folks have to say, we should actually let it affect how we deal with each other. But the issue is, is that we say it to each other behind closed doors at the little dinner parties. I don't know what's wrong with the community. I don't know why they keep shooting each other. And then get out in public. I don't know why y'all saying what's wrong with our community. I don't know why you saying why we shoot each other. I'm not saying either one is right, but when do we, when do we start taking some real, take a look at? Black children, up to 50% of 
of the general population, yet 42% of children in foster care in the United States are black. Black children and youth make up 32% of the arrests and 40% of all children and youth in residential placement and juvenile justice system. Dr. G talked about that yesterday. That's why we brought him here. I'm so impressed with that man. We will be working with him again. So we know, I thought I had to sit in, you know, some of the little specialty stuff that we've been talking about, because, you know, ACEs is the word these days. I'm an ACE trainer, you know. And I remember when I was trained in the ACEs, it was about 46 of us. And I think about seven of us was of color. OK. So they're going to trade because now we done realize that children suffer from trauma. Now, I didn't need to go to ACEs to find that out. So we do the training. And we got trained by the, one of the original, re original researchers. And my Native American sister, she said that you could see the smoke coming out her ears. I mean, both, all of us. You know. And she said, so you trying to tell us, now that you done came in here and told us that white folks have trauma, we supposed to go tell our community they got it too. You little late. <laughs> we know we got trauma. We act, we, some of us are acting it out every day. But it was, it, I mean, I've always known, I mean, you know, they used to say when I was coming up, you know, because I'm, I'm kind of old, I look good old. I, I clean up well, you like this? <laughs> Back in the day, people say, would say, you know, children are resilient. They will recover. They can handle anything. People used to say that. And I used to say, yeah, that's because they grow up to be screwed up adults. And they hide it well. Some of us hide it real well. You know, when I, start, when I get to the point of talking about men, I'm going to talk about how we hide it. So, 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 you know, you look at this ACE study, it talks about adverse childhood experiences affect uh, neurodevelopment. So we're talking about brain development. Now it's going to affect your social and emotional and cognitive skills. So I cannot handle my emotions. So if you look at me crossways, I curse you out, I lose my job. OK? I can't be in other spaces because at my house, if I don't snap on you before you snap on me, it ain't going to work. Now think about that. You know, we talk about bullying and all this kind of stuff. I said, I'm going to go out strict. Bullying and all that stuff. And, and our kids are actually getting thrown out of school a lot more than other kids around the bullying. But a lot of our little kids, if you talk to kids, see, we, we, we talk about kids, but we don't listen to kids. Because we don't always like what they say. You know, it's like my granddaughter told me the other day, she says, uh, Grandpa, I started to put a picture of her up there because she looked good too. Okay. <laughs> she said, why the black girls don't like me? I said, because you ain't trying to get no girl, no boyfriend at 13. And you still play with dolls. I said, how's that, how's, that, how's that feel, not to have the other black girls like you? She said, I don't care they don't like me. I'm your granddaughter, right, Des? <laughs> <laughs> so if I, if, you know, once I teach you how to speak, I'll bring her down here and it'll be a miniature me, you know. Because <laughs> she is real full of her little self, you know. It is a, it's real difficult sitting down talking to yourself. <laughs> and you don't believe in child abuse, because you know, I want to put you in both eyes. <laughs> but so we got this ACEs thing, and then we got adaptive behavior and those kind of pieces and increased diseases, you know. And we've been talking about disparities for years. So we got all the other traumas, because these are the traumas of the ACEs. We don't see historical trauma there. We don't see poverty, racism, none of them. Now there's a, 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 a Dr. Wade in Philadelphia, he done added all that stuff in there. We're gonna have him here in October and we'll let you know about that in the summit. 
But he's added those questions. I add those questions to as well. And one of the questions I add to my 20s, I use the 10 aces, okay? Then I add 10 more. And one of them is, did you grow up in a war zone? And, what, and the young men will say, Mr. Simmons, can I say yes to that? If that's what you feel, yes. <coughs> we don't listen to our children. Because we can't handle that truth as old people. All we want to talk about is the good old days. I lived the good old days. It wasn't that great. Because I didn't have a right to say anything. I didn't have a right to do anything. And they had a right to beat me whatever they could put their hands on. And my father did. And he loved me at the same time. And you know, there's still folks talk about when I do a radio show and, <clears throat> and I said, we're going to deal with youth violence. I got so many calls about what, what happened to these kids today. We ain't disciplining them. And then, you know, they're talking about beating them down. So I, I hung up the phone. I said, don't call in no more. And, and, and these are not the people that we always end up talking about, the brothers and sisters who are struggling real deep in the hood. These are the ones that are so-called, you can tell, these are the ones so-called educated. These are some of the same ones who are the professionals that work in our family. They might not say it at work, but if they're thinking it. Now, I'm not saying I go either way. But if we don't evolve, because, you know, because we, we, we can deal with some trauma. We, we, we have evolved from adapting to trauma. We have incorporated trauma into the culture. I mean, if nothing else, we can adapt. Black folks can adapt. It's like, you know, you, know, you give me a, a hoopty and I will shine that sucker up and put some spinners on it, even though spinners been out of style for the last 40 years. <laughs> and be styling, you know. The only pink suit I ever had, I keep it clean. <laughs> pink shoes never, you know. You know, yeah, you know, that'd be Uncle Big days. I, that was, that's who I used to be, Uncle Big, big sexy, had long, pretty hair. <laughs> being, the, being, being the hairdresser, back in the day, they would be, all the men would be under the, the hairdresser hoods and their women be sitting across waiting for Big Daddy. When, when they gonna be done, Daddy? You know. And we used to glamorize that. Now, our young folks done took it to a whole nother level of trafficking that our young people don't know that what they call dating is trafficking. So, I'm off script, but we're gonna keep it going. So, ACEs lead to these risk factors, and we see these risk factors in our community. I done lost two friends of one of a heart attack and one of an asthma attack. One was at work and the other one died at his dinner. Black men. You ever notice when you look at the TV and you get the black entertainers and the white entertainers, you ever notice the number, how old the white entertainers die and the black entertainers die? Well, you know, we just lost a, one of our best stars from the 1950s. He's 99 years old. Oh, we gonna miss him. We missed we miss a little jazz player and he is only 52. <laughs> Guess which one was black? Okay. So Minnesota did their own aces. Because, <coughs> you know, Minnesota, around the country, when I go around the country, you know, you know that people around the country think we got the answers to everything and we got the worst disparity second to Mississippi. Think about this. I mean, when I go to the city, you know, I got a license as chemical dependency counts. Do you know in Georgia? Because I called, I was going to get a license down in Georgia, but I just couldn't handle that craziness down there. Too many clicks. Black folks wouldn't let me in, you know. <laughs> and then I was talking too deep, and then I didn't get permission from the pastor down there to come, you know, because you don't get permission. You can't come in, or one of the sororities, you're done. Or fraternities, you, 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 you are, you done. So I, so, so I called down there and, and, and said, I got a Minnesota license. What do I need to do? Minnesota? All you gotta do is show up, send us the light, copy the license, and we'll give you a license. Really? I ain't gotta do nothing special? But no, you got a Minnesota license. <laughs> Again, when I go in someplace and you from Minnesota, oh, y'all doing great work up there. Yeah, we are. 
We do a lot of great work and a lot of research, but we don't listen to none of it we do. We can research the, we can research the ant's legs off. You know? So, so that when, so when in Minnesota, the, uh, the aces here, these are some of the aces that showed up. And the top ones is depression and anxiety. This is across the board. So we some anxious people and depressed. That's called Minnesota nice. <laughs> so, this is how it works down the ethnic groups. Are we surprised? I don't think so. Some of us might be. And, 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 and you got the three, right? And the Native American, African American is the highest almost in all of these areas. We just bounce around between the two. It's better in this state, but it's true around the country. And, we, and, and when you talk about historical trauma, those are the two groups I talk about when I talk about historical trauma. Because one, somebody came in the country and said, you know what? We discovered this, even though you were here. And, and guess what else we're going to do? We're going to take it, and then, you know, maybe a few of you, we're going to put you in boarding schools and teach you how to be good white people. And now we got them, them, them kids they took are all 50 year olds and you hear their stories. And they talk about not knowing how to raise their own children. And then our unique spot is we didn't ask to come here. Matter of fact, it's like, oh, we're going to take a few of you and we're going to take you over. You know, like when I talked to the young people, I said, you know, in the bottom of a slave ship, there was the equivalent of the Crips and Bloods, rival tribes. And I asked them, how long do you think they fought? You know, you know how the youngsters, man, you know, Mr. Simmons, they keep it real, man. They kept it real. They fought the whole way. Oh, three months. I said, and you the only one in shit in chains and you, and you, you didn't figure, you ain't going to figure it out before three months. This is something different. Then it got so bad that they didn't think that Africans were smart, and we started, re we was able to use a legal system and say, you can't keep us as slaves. But there was one black woman who said, my dad, my, my mama was, was white, so if, you know, I should be able to be free. And they got tired of that. So we decided we're going to have race, so everything black is a slave. And then you got to prove you ain't, so we get 12, 12 years of slave. And then on top of that, we're going to get real unique because we're going to start breeding our own s slaves. You know, get some real good prime bucks. That's the uniqueness of American slavery. Literally, bred people like animals. And today, we're treated less than many. And you know, I don't want to offend all you, some of you dog lovers, but <laughs> I've seen it. In my neighborhood, I feel it. And see, and, and I'm I, up, you know, I might look good all day, but I'm not a nice person. I have bad thoughts. <laughs> Luckily, I got my aces under control. I'd be wanting to run people over, <laughs> and the dog. You running through in the middle of the street with the dog, and you're going to stop my traffic so the dog can come running by. <laughs> uh -uh. But you're going to tell me what to do with my children. Look, poverty level. Now let's talk a little bit about this poverty thing. Okay, you see the high ones. I just got one question. Because, you know, we talk a lot about poverty. And again, I'm old. Since when poverty equal mistreating your children? 
So something done happened. Because black folks been poor a long time and made the best of the black poor. Now, I was raising the projects. We wasn't quite poor. My daddy just was cheap. <laughs> no, really. I mean, we, we, you know, the kids next to us, they were poor. When you're eating grease sandwiches and, you know, in the school, the, the, the clothes you wear at the church, you wear to school and you play in and everything else, you poor. Now, our cars might not have been new, but we had little used suits and stuff because, you know, we was good Christian children, at least out in public. <laughs> it's true. At home, we was terrorized. You know, all the domestic violence and drinking and, you know, we hid well. That's another way we have learned to adapt. So, but, so, so I, I, I cringe and I could be wrong and you know, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I like folks to disagree with me because that means they're thinking. Because we don't always have to agree on everything. But I think we got to really start really thinking about how we throw this, tr this poverty thing around and how we use it. Yes, the poverty has increased in some of our communities and that kind of stuff, but we got to get to the point of, you know, poverty didn't always equal mistreating our children. So we have to think about what's going on with that, and I might touch on that. So, so we have the ACEs, now we got the toxic stress that affect brain development. So let's talk a little bit about toxic stress. So we got positive stress, and some people don't know that positive stress. See, one of the things about our community, the American community, is we don't do a good job of talking about healthy stress management. Even us who are educated don't have a good hand on healthy stress management, like respect your time and others too. Mm. Watch who you surround yourself with including family. Mm. You know, I mean, I believe in the collective, but when the collective is a little sour, I got to go off and be by myself somewhere. That's part of the stress management. But, but because we have used, because we have developed behaviors just to deal with our stress, we held so hard onto the collective, we forgot to be individuals. Sometimes I, I had to be an individual to heal. I had to let go of my family long enough to be able to be, understand that they love me the best way they know how to be able to deal with them. If I don't do that, I'm not here. If I don't do that, I'm not sober. I come from a long line of, of pimps and drug dealers and we were good at it and looked good doing it. My uncle, when he died, he was one of the prettiest corpses I ever seen. Had one wife, three girlfriends, and they all showed up. We had to have seven limousines, because nobody wanted to sit in the same limousine, and we down south. Let me tell you the story how that went. So by that time, me and my brothers who all live up north, that folks thought we was odd, because we was Margie's children. We was all in the drug game by then. And so we got a limousine of our own, and the limousine, like one of the old 70s movies, the limousine door open, and all that came up was a puff of smoke. And I'm not talking cigarettes. <laughs> and we down south, and you know, if you're from down south, they take that funeral stuff seriously, right? You wear your black suit, your black tie. One brother had on a pink suit, the other one had electric blue, and, you know. I had some red gaiters on my black suit. I had the black suit on. <laughs> sure. What do they want? And, and we get out of the limousine, and then people say, who are them? Who is that? Oh, them Margie's boys. You see, they, everybody was scared of Margie, so they're like, oh, we leave them alone. That's why they're crazy. You know, because the long line of disrespecting women all of them was married to church women, which was interesting. So, so I had to disown my brother, you know, because I, I didn't have to go to the crack house because he was the crack man. I had my stuff delivered. And he, wrote, he, he took my money and abused me just like he did everybody else because that was part of the business. I just got special treatment in my abuse, you know. And then he couldn't understand. I said, man, I can't deal with you no more. 
He said, but I'm your brother. But you're my dealer too. And I can't stay clean dealing with you. Well, I put it up when you come by. No, 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 I know it's in the house. So in 1990, I stopped using. I ain't used since, okay? Because I was tired. You know what, you know, the no thing what made me not use is I was raised with hypocrites. Some community leaders, some pastors, teachers, social workers. And I was being a hypocrite. Because I was a CD concert getting high. Oh, yeah. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> and they were the white kids. Okay, I had a party at my house, and they said, can we, uh, Mr. Simmons, do you care if we smoke dope? I said, no, I hid mine, because I was trying to be respectable. I said, sure. Man, I ain't never seen so many different kind of color weed in all my life. Man, I, I, good thing I was at home, because I didn't wake up for four days. OK. So, <laughs> got to stay on time. <laughs> yeah. Toxic stress. So we got good stress, normal, 20 minutes. Something happened, get scared for your child, you act, and then you, you, know, you get the, that adrenaline rush. Them hormones, which are actually also contribute to sugar diabetes, stress hormones contribute to that if they're at high levels. But it's normal because it's supposed to come down. You're supposed to be able to come down. Then we have tolerable stress. Tolerable stress could be the death of a loved one. But for a child, how do we make it tolerable? If you got a healthy adult around that child and say, baby, it ain't your fault. And that's been true about, about a lot of stress. If you in, intervene early in trauma and you let that child know, because kids are, are real interesting. One and one is two. This happened, I had to do something wrong, or why is this being done to me? But if you guys, so, you know, I tell the story about this young lady whose father died when she was five years old. She was a daddy's girl. And we're going to talk about them daddy girls in, in a minute. And he died of a, heart, a massive heart attack while she was at school. She'd never seen him again. And nobody dealt with her. And so when she became an adult, she couldn't have her relationships. Her meaningful relationships never lasted. Because the thing is, is the fear was, once I care for you, you hurt me. Because nobody sat that young little five-year-old down, your daddy love you. It ain't your fault. Tolerable. Doesn't mean that things don't happen. But that means that, that, that means that you have to have adults or some type of adult or somebody to help that child walk through it. And you help them walk through it, they don't carry it the same way. Toxic stress. Strong, frequent, prolonged. Like domestic violence, street violence, school violence. And when I say school violence, we're talking about some teacher violence. And, I, and let, me, let me explain to you what I'm talking about. I got a grandson who's hell on wheels. And he got some stuff going on with him, you know. I mean, you know, I'm, you know people get about, talk about pills and not using pills. He's real different without his. He really is. We got to manage. He does well. And he even knows. Okay? And he's really, really, really smart. I mean, he's really smart. And he knows when an adult can't handle it. And, and, and once he figure out you can't handle it, he take you out. <laughs> he, had a, he had a daycare teacher who had issues with her weight, and he would go in in the morning and say, hi, Miss Nancy, you know you're fat, and walk past her. <laughs> <laughs> now, Miss Nancy is the adult. Miss Nancy was doing some of her passive aggressive stuff with my baby. 
He tried that stuff with me. He said, you know, Grandpa, you know you're old, you're going to die soon. I said, yeah, but not before you, you don't got my face. <laughs> and he said, you, Grandpa, you so funny. Yeah, you are too. Because when he get angry, he, he, he don't necessarily have to run up on you. He got, he got words. He told his one grandma, you know, I don't like you right now. I wish you was a roach so I could squash you. I know. And you sitting at the school with folks who scared little black children. He ain't but that big. This recently, they wouldn't let him go on. They tricked him not to go on the field trip. Now, my daughter don't play. My wife don't play. Them poor teachers, I don't think they're going to do that again. <laughs> and so I sat him down and said, why did, why did, I, well, now at first I said, why they, you know, had these issues with you? And I thought about who I was talking to. It was like, okay, um, how are you dealing with them? <laughs> and I said, what do you think the problem is? Well, they give up on me too easy. And, and they ain't fair. I said, first of all, you better get used to that. <laughs> now he ate. This is how I talk to my grandkids, because you know, if I don't talk to them like this, I'll be beating them down, because I was raised to beating them down. I mean, I, I have that in me. I have to contain that too. Like I said, I'm not a nice guy. I have to contain myself. I'm an angry black man, and it come up, it can come up any time. Any time. And so I talked to them. I said, you know, life ain't fair. Get used to that. My issue is you don't add to the unfairness. So we're going to teach you some skills. What do you like to do? I like to draw. So you draw? I No, I like to write books. You write books? And I see you, you, this boy, we talk to you, you, there's some stuff in his head that you just like, you know, you know. And I said, are you writing? He said, yeah, where's your stories? They're at school. I said, you don't write at home? He said, no, nah, I ain't got no paper. No, nah, I know better than that. Mama buy him some paper. So I gave him a leather-bound notebook. I said, here, write your stories. You know, because I'm thinking about getting paid. You hear about these little kids all the time writing these little books and stuff? <laughs> uh, shit, we get ready to publish them. I'm going to get paid. So back to the, the toxic, the so, so, so thing. Luckily, my, my grandkids have been raised to be happy. Do you understand how many of our kids are not raised to be happy? Do you understand that we have folks who will say, well, look at a white kid, or oh, he all happy. That's a white kid. No, I have certainly had folks say that. Like, we don't, our kids don't deserve to be happy. And they don't even believe they deserve to be happy. That toxic stress. And, and when we talk about the toxic stress, these are some of the, the issues here. We're going to spend a lot of time on them. Cognitive issues, social issues. And then we're talking about these young adults who can't keep jobs and that kind of stuff. Of course you can't keep no job when nobody can talk to you. Why you lose your job, brother? Oh man, I didn't like the way they talked to me. What did they say to you? They kept telling me about my being late. What the? <laughs> so what was they supposed to do? Man, I was only about five minutes late, man, and I do, they said I do good work. I was getting my job done. Look, you're supposed to be on time. That's part of your job, too. But he couldn't connect the dots. We're talking about a grown person. Here's some more. Productivity, physical, chronic disease, and stress. People are trapped in, uh, hist in history, and history is trapped in them. So these are some of them trauma responses we have a tendency to see. Increased aggression, attempting to control my physical and social environment. So I mean mug you. And back in the day, you could do that to social workers and get anything you want from them. Either that or a case. <laughs> no, for real. I skip. You just go in and scare a white social worker, you know, go scare Miss <laughs> Jane. I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> I need an extra bus card. Okay. <laughs> 
And Miss Jane is in the office next door. Can, can you take uh, uh, Sam next time? <laughs> <laughs> Folks don't play that no more. So we forget. We got to connect the dots. Because I, I know folks used to do that. And think about now. We got this little eight-year-old boy who sits down and says, you know, Mr. Simmons, I'm tired of being crazy. What do you mean you're tired of being crazy? Well, my mama said if I don't act crazy, we don't get paid. Increased vigilance and suspicion. I'm suspicious of everybody. I only trust the people close to me. Ooh. We all acting up. We going to be close, huh? But you don't know how to separate yourself. Because one of the biggest dependencies in the African American community as a result of our trauma is codependency. Our inability to disconnect when we need to. And if you disconnect, if you, get, you get big mama tell you, why you won't talk to that boy? Because he get on my nerves. When I disown my brother, my mama stopped talking to me. Are you the oldest? You supposed to be forgiven? No, not yet. I, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest grown man. I'm taking care of grown men. They get in trouble. The only one happy is them. Only one broke is me. Only one working is me. I left, men, I left Rock Island, Illinois when I was 19 years old. And my daddy said, why are you leaving and going to Minnesota? We don't know nobody in Minnesota. I said, that's why I'm going there. He said, if you leave right now, don't ever come back. I'm the only one who didn't. Right after that, guess who followed me here? All my brothers. Sent last two to school. And then when they didn't go to school, I sent them back to mom and them. You don't go to school, you can't stay with me. Yeah, there was a period that folks were all mad at me for me taking care of me. So if we don't get some of that stuff out the way, how are we supposed to move forward and t even if we wanted to get the help, but we, we too embarrassed, we're going to be embarrassed by other folks to get help because you, we strong, we black people. Increased sensitivity to threats. So again, that defensive posture and avoidance of new situations or seeing things that ain't there, connecting dots that ain't there. Why are you looking at me, man? We got issues? If you keep looking at me, we're going to have issues. Because you disrespected me with them big glasses. <laughs> that was wrong for that, wasn't I? <laughs> that, now we do got issues, huh? <laughs> OK, let's move it on. I'm full of myself. I'm delirious, OK? Increased psychological problems. So we're talking about. Uh, immunity. Think about it. If you've got a lot of stress and the stress is generational, don't be surprised that you, your immunity done broke down. Them high stress levels. This is why this is so important about this trauma thing that we keep avoiding as a people. Increased alcohol use. We, and, and, and I'm an alcohol counselor. One of the things that I've always been missing to me is the thing about historical trauma and the connection. We've been using alcohol and drugs to medicate ourselves for years. Remember, we adapt. And selling drugs. It's adapting. So we need to address alcohol different. We got, you know, we can go into treatment, but we don't stay sober a lot of times because you don't took the one thing away from me to get temporary relief from my life because I don't have much other skills. No sense of time. So if I'm chronic state of danger, I develop a sense of future, or no extent, a sense of future and frequently uh, be expecting to die. So I don't care. Our kids right now, they were more concerned about how they died than how they live. You hear that, you listen to the kids, yeah man, Pookie, he went down and he would, you know, man, he got shot four times, man. You know, he, he kept it real. Rest in peace t-shirts all on their walls. Surrounded by death. And then we want to ask question, why? Don't even know how to go to a funeral no more. When you go to so many of them, how are you going to know how? What's that, what does that mean? 
And then stand outside with the Hennessy and pour it down for the brothers who ain't here so it becomes a party. You know, following Cooley High and all that other kind of stuff. So, my side tribe. How are the children? This is how they would acknowledge each other. How are the children? Letting them know that that tribe really thought kids was the thing. If the kids are well, the community is well. So the response would be, and we're talking about a tribe that was known to be one of the most intelligent and most fierce. How are the children? And even if you didn't have children, you would say the children are well. So this is how we're going to do this. And I got about 10 minutes I'm going to do this with. Only by seeing the problem clearly and experiencing them can we do something about it. So we can't ignore the trauma. We can't ignore the trauma that's being done to us by others, but we definitely can't ignore the trauma that we've been doing to each other. I got this, what we call a trauma list for some young people, and I say, you, you got your system list, and you got the black list. Tell me your trauma. And I want you to let it, write it down. And the look on their face when they write it down, or the list, the black list being real long. And we, in our community, we have no conversation for that. None. So human compassion is equal to human human compassion is equal to human cruelty. Only is it up to each other as to balance that out. So professionals and policymakers. Change don't happen without folks feeling uncomfortable. I am so tired of our policymakers who will promise all kind of stuff, but they don't want to be uncomfortable. But they can continue not to want to be uncomfortable if we don't push them with a plan. I've seen so many times, we want you to stop doing this to us. Will you stop doing this to us? Okay, what do you want us to do? I don't know. <laughs> Just stop doing it to us. Folks doing the work, got to be aware of their own biases. And, and we got to quit being shy about not incorporating historical trauma and the experience of slavery in the work we do around mental health. You know, this equity stuff has been talked about a lot, coming down from the mayor and the governor and all that. And you know, I was trying to figure out what that means, because I'm trying to figure out how that work. And so you got this little picture here. And you know, you see where they got the extra boxes because you know, life ain't even. So you're supposed to help folks with extra support so you can, they can be able to see over the fence. And so what happens, with, especially with our nonprofit situation, we'll give you some boxes and then we kick it from under you five years later. We ain't, you cannot get equity without sustainable money. And some nonprofit money ain't sustainable. And if you're addressing a community that's full of trauma with only not mostly nonprofit money, don't be surprised if we end up in the situation every five years starting over. <laughs> Especially with the people who have been conditioned to be able to start over. We know how to start over. We have a difficulty sustaining stuff. So what you're doing is feeding our trauma. You ain't helping. And then when you say, well, you can come get the money, but we got all these strings on it. And I understand the strings. Because you know, I know the system of giving money to some of their little friends or some of the fake people they're scared of, you know, some of our community leaders. They keep giving them the same money. I keep trying to find out how certain people get the same money and ain't doing nothing. <laughs> ain't doing nothing. And they still getting money. I, got, I had a situation, I wrote a proposal, and somebody said, you know, your, this other proposal, we're going to fund this from these people, and it looked like somebody kindergarten made it, but they're going to still give money, so we're going to keep them quiet. You ain't doing our community no service. 
Or, you know, they'll come and say, well, Sam, we want you to come talk to us about historical trauma, and they go hire this other guy that makes them feel good. <laughs> the other black guy, you know. Because he, he wants to be liked so bad, he'll say whatever they want. And it ain't that he's a bad person. See, I'm not into hating because he's a bad person, because the person, one of the people is my friend. And he know it. I ain't mad at him. But if you really gonna make some change, you got to be willing to be uncomfortable. Because we've been uncomfortable for a long time. Unfortunately, we done got so used to being uncomfortable, we let you, we, we will help you be comfortable. Walk into a meeting with my dark glasses on, and you know, I remember one of the people said, we was just talking about you. What were you saying about me? Well, what they, they, they were saying when they first met you, they were scared to death for you. I said, who was that? A few white females. And I said, and he's laughing. I said, that ain't funny. So what were they scared of? Gonna jump across the table and rape them or something? That's why I don't take my dark glasses off most of the time, but I got some pretty brown ones now. But, And you know how that make me feel? My daddy died behind this. And my daddy was 6'6", 310 pounds. He would make sure he made other people comfortable and it didn't work. He would walk in the room and kind of scrunch himself down. He forgot he was black. He thought it was just because he was big. I don't care if you're scared of me. That's you. That is you. Now that means I might not get paid as much as everybody else, but I live comfortably. <laughs> I live very well. And I can wake up and be happy. So this equity stuff, don't talk about this equity stuff unless you're gonna invest in it for real. If you ain't willing to give up nothing, don't say nothing. I mean substantially. And if you ain't willing to deal with, at least with one you know I brought these young ladies up in here, they was willing to deal with some different kind of folks. And you notice those answers they got from the community, they were real, you've heard those. And they was willing to talk about the recommendations because they came from our community. Have you, have you heard that very often? You know we get these recommendations from out the book and they so old. If you want to deal with the black community, you go to the black organizations and you talk to the black leadership. We don't even do that. <laughs> compassion, accountability. Accountability without compassion is never fair. Everybody go, we gotta be more accountable. Make them more accountable. It's always, we gotta make them more accountable. But you unaccountable, and we know that if, if, if I like to think about accountability, there's always somebody I like somebody else. Oh, I'll let you slide. But I'm gonna keep you, I'm gonna lock you up, boy. Compassion without no, without no accountability is chaotic. And we see this we try, in some of our programs, we try to bend over so backwards for our people, not knowing that we are doing them more harm, trying to make up for how other people are treating us. And that's why some of our programs ain't still open no more because we were being so compassionate to the point where it hurt, but we wouldn't do no paperwork. So we got to, I only got two more minutes for this because I know I want to get you out of here on time. So this is, this is some of the stuff we're dealing with the men. Their masculinity tied to sexuality. Rite of passage equals trauma. I remember when rite of passage in the black community meant something. Ask a young man, when did you decide you was a man? And almost over half of the guys I talked to talk about some kind of trauma. If that's the rite of passage, why are you surprised by the behavior? And then if my, if my, if my masculinity is tied to my sexuality, then I'm gonna have babies I can't afford, all willy-nilly, mistreat women, and then say I love them too. So the men in the community, what they can do is, is that they can start trying to figure out ways to bond around nonviolence and respect their partners or respect the other folks in their community and hold each other accountable. We will hold each other accountable behind closed doors but not in each other's face. 
Because we want to keep it real until later. Because, you know, one thing about us men, black men, we like peacocks. S smell good, look good, drive good, ain't no good. <laughs> and this is not the brother in the hood. This is the brother like me. See, we give, the, we give that brother a little slide, you know. Oh, he look good, we're gonna go out with him. He got three, four other girlfriends, but oh, he, 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 I'm the one. Dude, you, better get, you better get it real. You one of. And if you don't wanna be one of, why are you, why are you still sticking with it? Well, I'm gonna break his windshield out. Okay, mess with me. <laughs> we need to take the treatment to men. If, we, if part of change is you got to be willing to do something different. Well, you come to us. We ain't been coming to you. Take it to you. That's what Dr. G was talking about. Take it to you. If you really are invested, if you ain't invested, shut up. Or at least give somebody the money who is. And I'm not saying you shouldn't vet them because you can't give all of us money. Because some of us take the money and only about 2% end up in the community. I've seen that too often. We know what to do with our community, but you got your trauma too. Your trauma is covered up by you call yourself a leader. Develop supports in terms of mental health initiatives that are geared to black men. Black women, black women were affected by the drug, by the crack era, and we don't talk about that. They were the keepers of the children. They were the keepers of the community. We don't give them no credit, and then we wonder why we're looking at children and parents who have been traumatized, sharing their trauma with their children, and the trauma is so thick amongst these last two generations, oh, not just the teachers can't handle it, we can't either. Because we done three layers of trauma from crack air, because these are the babies that the, that the system took away from mothers to, to, to punish them Let's keep it real. They took them children to punish them and they had no place to put them and so all of a sudden we got a new cottage industry, foster care, and we stick it, we wasn't doing no background checks then. Couldn't have been. I got too many stories of folks who was in foster care who was abused for you to have been doing background checks. Now we want to have compassion around some drug use. Oh, really? And then folks say, I didn't see that. Oh, well, you know what? You weren't looking. <laughs> Women being trained to feel that they got to be responsible for everybody else at the cost of themselves. That's why when we deal with domestic cases, girlfriend will come to me and says, I'm going to get some help. Mr. Simmons, can you fix him? Girl, I ain't talking about him right now. <laughs> but it's built in her. The master gave her the power with no power. Talked to her, made her responsible for him, and she took it to save him. And we've resented you ever since. I love this poster, it tells it all. We need to support and protect black women and girls because we don't spend enough time with our girls. We don't, we don't spend so much time talking about boys needing their daddies, and, and it's been proven girls need their daddies earlier. That's when we got a rite of passage. So if a girl got a daddy like me, she ain't playing. I used to feel sorry for my little girl, you know, because I knew she wasn't going to get too many dates. <laughs> and because the, because the generations have shrink, now she's competing with her mama with the same dude. When the generation shrunk, then the big mama left. Because big mama used to keep it in order. Big mama come out of slavery too. Because the master would go into slave quarters and talk to big mama, only one. Ethel, what's going on in here? <laughs> master, I don't know, but we could use a little more grain. Ethel knew what the deal was. It's about parents. The fear of the truth passed blind the, the, the generation and the goals of healing. So we really got to do something with our, our parents. Our parents are so, so traumatized, and you wonder why they share the trauma with their children. 
We need to talk to them. We need to help them. We need to teach them about trauma. We need to help them have places to talk about their trauma. Do you understand when I talk to parents about ACEs, you know, oh, that's some highfalutin stuff. No, everybody loves, if you tell them, look, this affects your children, and you say it to them in a way where I'm not blaming you because that happened to you, baby girl, or baby boy, because we got to forget, don't forget daddies. We can't be doing this gatekeeping with the daddy stuff either because you don't like him because he don't care nothing about you. All he care about is that child. And you ain't getting your feelings developed because, because I know how hard that could be to have somebody looking straight through you like you don't, like you're trash. And how that could get you to do what's not best for your child. How, think about how deep that is. Think about black folks that have done that for so long where folks would look right straight to you and not look through you and then talk about they talking to you. Now think about that to a whole nother level. Have a black man look at you and you know that you, you two had this child, probably had it in, on a whim. It's like throwing seed in the ground and hoping it grow. And then want to get mad because it grew up in bad soil. The village that hides the truth cannot expect to heal but to pass on the pain. So the community got to get over some of these stigmas. I'm about tired of the stigma. We got some issues. We just afraid to talk about trauma. We need to name it. Emotional health. We could, if, if, if black folks are scared of the word mental health, use emotional health. Do you understand if we address emotional health, a lot of mental health issues would disappear? Because I'm acting out because I'm emotionally in pain. So it looked like schizophrenia. Bipolar. Oh, he was nice a few seconds ago. <laughs> and we got to quit believing a real black person suffers. Think about that. Keep it real. You ain't black enough. You ain't suffered enough, Obama. You know? <laughs> Parallel trauma. Folks doing the work. This came up this morning. We really got to work with our folks who are working with our folks because they're traumatized. The trauma is very thick. We cannot do this work and not have nobody support us. We talk about trauma-informed care, and trauma-informed care says down in the bottom that you're supposed to care about the staff. Ain't nobody doing a good job of that. And for black folks, we got the same traumas this young man said. We got the same trauma as our clients, and we're being mistreated just like the client by the staff, and then, this, then the clients know we're being mistreated, and they look at this like so what what you gonna say to me you can't even take care of your own stuff they don't respect you how why, why, why I gotta listen to you I'm gonna go past you and go to Miss Mary Miss Mary can I have because they know how to go to Miss Mary Miss Mary can I have some some a, a, a bus card what are you for to deal with Larry oh you know Larry don't like me and you know I'm telling the truth okay She's down here with me to get over because you want to go home. So do I. <laughs> Our community leaders need to do, role model the willingness to do their own healing journey. If they're not willing to do their healing journey, how are they going to lead? I'm traumatized. I got to be reminded of that every day. If I don't manage that, I'm going to hurt somebody. But I got skills. Like when I do anger management class, I said, look, dude, I'm an angry black man. He says, how are you going to do the anger management class? I said, because I know I'm angry. What's your problem? 